Peter Gordon over there, who's going to play the saxophone. And uh, Lenny Newfeld is my favorite ex-husband. And Peter Gordon is my favorite friend. And the reason that I know Lenny Newfeld is because Peter Gordon's girlfriend, who used to be Lenny Newfeld's girlfriend, called up Lenny, no, Lenny called up her. She gave him my telephone number, right? That's right, Lenny? That's right. He called me up, we made a date, and got together. So as you can see, these two men have had the same girlfriend who is a friend of mine. And also, they've both been my boyfriends. So you can see how we all have a lot in common. <laughs> so Lenny is going to read tonight. Is there anything in there about me in that one? No. Oh, that's too bad. Another time. Who, who's in that one? Actually, uh, nobody real. Nobody real? No. You changed your style? Totally. Oh my goodness. That's wonderful. Yeah. I'm glad. Yeah, me too. Peter, are you going to play the saxophone? Are you going to say anything? No. No? Then no. why do you have a mic on? In case I change my mind. In case you change your mind? Yeah. Do you change your mind often? No. So you're going to read? I'm going to read. You're the main event? Shall I start? Maybe I'll just do one more step, okay? Please do. This is the hop hop. Okay, I'm finished. Thank you, Jim. Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs> the story is Lemuel had been born on a mountain in the Ozarks. When he was three, his parents had been out in the fields when a sudden storm came up. They'd been struck by lightning and killed. Lemuel was taken by one of his maternal aunts to St. Louis. There she had sold him on the baby black market. The couple who purchased him were moving from San Diego to New York. The husband, Jerry Harvey, worked at the San Diego office of Pacific Telephone. He'd just gotten a promotion to a middle-level managerial position with a change of location to New York. Jerry and his wife, Barbara, had been trying to have a child for three years. They'd been married eight. The doctor said that Jerry had a low sperm count, but that most men with his count could still father children. Nor could he rule out the possibility that one or both of them might be sterile. They'd applied to various adoption agencies, but there were long waiting periods for healthy white babies, which was the kind they wanted. A man in the black market had cased them one afternoon as they left one of the adoption agencies. After investigating them further, he decided to talk to them. Jerry Harvey had just gotten news of his promotion. In their new location, no one would know them. No one would find it strange that they had a child. The best merchandise are infants less than six months old. They are still very unformed, not yet even seriously committed to their name. These almost always become the true children of their adopted parents. The older the child is at adoption, the more habits it has. Lemuel, for instance, would always have to be called Lemuel, unless you wanted to seriously damage his ego. He also had a number of fixed likes and dislikes. These inconvenient qualities made him cheap. The dealer in San Diego had an acquaintance in St. Louis who dealt in second-class merchandise. Everything was easily arranged. New York was as unfamiliar to Jerry and Barbara as they were to Lemuel, but they all tried their best. Jerry worked hard, Barbara was a wife and mother, Lemuel watched TV a lot. Jerry and Barbara told their new friends in New York that Jerry's mother's father had been named Lemuel. Then they never mentioned the old man again. Everyone assumed that Jerry's feeling for his grandfather was too much to talk about. However, when Lemuel was seven, his father's mother, Sarah, came east to visit. Jerry and Barbara told Lemuel that he must not talk about Grandma Sarah's father to her because it would make her very sad to think about him. When Sarah arrived, Lemuel told her that he knew it would make her sad to talk about her father, so he wouldn't. Sarah's father's name had been Harry, and Sarah asked Jerry why he told Lemuel it would make her sad to hear Harry's name. 
Lemuel tried to remind Sarah that her father's name was Lemuel, like his own. Jerry and Barbara were trying to shush him up. Sarah became very upset. She thought it was terrible to tell a child such an enormous lie about himself. She said that if they didn't tell him the truth, she would. So Jerry and Barbara explained to Lemuel that he was adopted. Lemuel was frightened and turned to Sarah for help, since she seemed to be on his side. Sarah extended her visit, staying with Jerry and Barbara in their spare room. It was summer vacation for Lemuel. In the fall, he would enter first grade. Sarah stayed till school started. She explained to Lemuel how Jerry and Barbara had loved him so much and felt so much like he was really their own little boy that they thought it would be best if that's what everyone thought. They just didn't realize how hard it is to live with such a big lie. She knew that it was hard for Lemuel to learn that he was adopted, but he must be a strong boy and live with the truth. After all, Jerry and Barbara really did love him. They had chosen him over all the other little boys and girls they could have adopted. He was very special to them. This line of reasoning had a certain weight with Lemuel, and he wanted, it to, he wanted to believe it. Jerry and Barbara did what they could. They moved to a suburban community in New Jersey. They had new friends, and Lemuel was in a different school. From then on, if the subject came up, they told the truth about their relationship to Lemuel, that he was adopted. When Lemuel was 17, he graduated from high school. He'd always remembered that Sarah had mentioned that Jerry and Barbara had adopted him in St. Louis. He didn't want to go to college. He wanted to go to St. Louis. He had vague memories still of having lived with another family before he lived with Jerry and Barbara. Sarah had told him he'd been three when Jerry and Barbara had adopted him. This, plus the fact that Jerry and Barbara had never discussed with Lemuel the details of his adoption, made him suspect that he had not passed through the hands of the regular adoption agencies. By hanging around the tough parts of town in St. Louis, and mentioning to everyone he met that he knew a couple of people who were willing to pay $500 to anyone who could give them reliable information on buying a baby, Lemuel managed to establish contact with three men who claimed to be able to help. Two of them demanded payment in advance or no deal. The third demanded to meet the people. Lemuel said he had to protect them. He had to be sure he wasn't a cop. The man said that Lemuel could bring a tape recorder to their first meeting and that he, the man, would be the first to bring up the subject of buying babies. That way, if he was a cop, he would be guilty of entrapment and there would be no case. Lemuel said he had to think about it. He called a lawyer out of the phone book and asked him how much he would charge to give him legal advice over the phone. The lawyer said $50. Lemuel sent him $50 in the mail and then called him back. He explained the situation to the lawyer in full and the lawyer said that the man had been telling the truth. With the evidence of the tape recording, if the man was a policeman, it would be entrapment. Lemuel thanked the lawyer and got back in touch with the man. They arranged to meet on a certain street corner where the man would pick Lemuel up in his car. When Lemuel got into the car, he told the man that he had $500 for him if he could help him find out the truth about his birth. At first, the man was disappointed and angry. If Lemuel's deal had been real, he would have stood to make considerably more than $500. But Lemuel's sincere and open manner affected him. Also, there was the $500, and it hadn't really cost him much time or money. The man said he knew other men in the same business as himself. He'd only been in business for 10 years, but he knew four or five guys that had been working for 15 years or more. The thing was that Lemuel was going to have to come up with at least another 500, because if they did find the guy with the information, he wasn't going to give it up for nothing. The man then fixed it up with a friend. They drove into the hills between old mines and Butts, Missouri, and found an old couple living on a poor, isolated farm. They paid them $200 to tell Lemuel that they remembered him. The man's friend told Lemuel that he personally had handled the transaction with his adopted parents. The old couple told Lemuel that his true parents had been killed in an automobile accident and that their house had burnt down soon after. Now, Lemuel's first home was just part of a neighboring farmer's field. Lemuel believed them. He went that night to look for the first and last time at the part of the earth where he'd spent his earliest two years. The man and his friends split the remaining $800 and drove back to St. Louis. When Lemuel returned from his visit to his birthplace, he was surprised to find them gone. However, he realized that they owed him nothing. The old couple, too, obviously wanted, wanted him to leave. He started walking back on the road to St. Louis.
I think it would be nice if you would play. As I let my apartment door swing shut behind me, I had a sudden premonition that I left my keys in the apartment and would be locked out. However, instead of stopping the door from closing, I reached down to tap my pocket where my keys should be. As the door slammed, I felt the keys in my pocket, and so with a sigh of relief, but inwardly berating myself for letting the door close without being sure I had my keys, I went down the stairs. I walked casually up the street, loose-limbed and long-stepping so that the teenage boys who stood in groups on the stoops of the buildings could see that I was independent and purposeful and that it wouldn't pay them to harass me because their childish jibes couldn't touch me. Though the city blocks are rectangles, and so it should make no difference to the length of one's route, whether one first goes north and then west or vice versa, or first a block north and then a block west and so on, yet because there are parks and squares that one can cut diagonally across, it is possible to figure out a shortest way of getting from here to there. Whenever I have to be someplace, I always take the shortest route because I don't like being late. I'm almost never late. But when I don't have to be somewhere at any special time, for instance, if I'm going to the museum or just taking a walk, I like to let the traffic lights determine my path, following the green lights, never crossing against the red, and using the small choices that remain to try and ensure that I don't go too far east or west, as the case may be, before I have gone far enough north or south, so that I won't be forced at the end of my trip to stand waiting on a corner for the light to change. But today I was going to my appointment, so I walked straight up the avenue, giving money to the beggars who asked me, ignoring the prostitutes and drug addicts, cutting through the park, past the old quiet brownstones. I have a good job, but have been disappointed too often in love, and so have lost my faith in life. The universe seems like a great machine powered by a single impulse, mysterious to me, but which others understand intuitively. I asked them clever leading questions, hoping to learn the secret without betraying my ignorance. And the answers I get, though apparently easy to understand, simple and clear, somehow in the end become little mysteries themselves. Each sentence is like a whirlpool within a whirlpool, a little vortex that disappears down its own center, until I've come to think that each man speaks a private language, and so their answers can never pertain to my questions, except in the most abstract and general way, which isn't helpful. I was upset to see that the building where I had my appointment was having its facade renovated. A huge scaffolding had been put up over the whole front of the building, and workmen were busily knocking off chunks of masonry, steam blasting, painting, etc., but in such numbers that they looked like a swarm of ants crawling up and down the walls, in and out of the windows, talking, working, gesturing above the noise. The front entrance was blocked off, and an attractive young woman was directing their arriving clients around to a side entrance, which I had never noticed before. In fact, I realized that the neighboring building must have been torn down during the previous week, because there was now a vacant lot on the east side of the building. I was trying to understand why there was a side entrance in a wall which formerly had been pressed up against the wall of an adjoining building. There must have been communicating doors between the buildings, I thought. But even that was strange because the building that had been torn down was a much older one and had been a small residential building with shops on the ground floor. So it was hard to see why they should have communicated. Nevertheless, I went in the side entrance and up a dim stairway, which was dirty and musty and appeared to have been unused for a long time. On the second floor, I got my bearings and went down the corridor to the waiting room. I sat for a few minutes, trying to get my thoughts back in order. When my appointment came in, and motioning me to follow, walk down the hall.
Well, all right. Well, then I'll read this because this is more appropriate for them. Okay. okay. This is called Thank God for the President. Suppose there's this guy, and he wants to be president for his own personal reasons, which no one really understands. One of the things he believes, he says out loud. He says it, and he gets elected president. After he's elected, he keeps saying it. Now there's this country, this society, which is always changing. Not everything is done today the way it was done 10 or 20 years ago. The society has changed. And no one really understands how or why. So suppose that the society is changing in such a way that it will be happening. And it starts happening. People say, my God, look at that. That president said it, and it's happening. He made it happen. If this president says it about different things, and many of them happen, and they're important things, then the people say, he's a great president. Every time he says it, it happens. So a great president is one who perceives that it is happening before most other people perceive it. Presidents are visionary poets. But no one man, but no one man can really, can really make important things happen. It takes many men working together. They don't get together and decide to make it happen. But enough of them act in such a way that their actions taken together cause it, cause it to happen, to happen. Each person acts for his own reasons, which no one really understands. But people like to think that they're in control of events. So they say, post hoc, post hoc, post hoc ergo, ergo propter hoc. Meaning that one thing happened before another thing. Therefore, the first thing must be the cause of the second. A president doesn't make things happen. He sits around with the rest of us and watches. But if he's a talented watcher of things, so that he notices them before we do, we say he's making them happen. He says he's making them happen. So we all agree. And we feel like if we're not in control, if we're not in control, if we're not in control, well, at least someone is. And thank God for the president. I think you should show that to the camera. That's a very interesting manuscript. You're full of good All ideas. The what were the words you blocked out? All the ones I didn't like. Why didn't you like them? They weren't necessary. Why did you write them down in the first place? He was experimenting, Peter. Don't you ever experiment? Do you always know what you're doing the first time you do it? I've always admired these women in Newsweek, uh, who all have the. Well, far show them the next page too. That's even better. Pictures. 
No, show my favorite page. Oh, oh that's yeah, oh, that's, that's, that's my favorite yeah, page. Right. That is, that is a nice page. I think I'm going to be quiet for the rest of the evening, Lenny, so. You can make as much noise as you like. You want me? Oh. I like your noise. You like my noise? Yeah. Oh, that's very nice of you. Thank you. <laughs> ignorant Myrtle Davis was killed in the collapse of the Broadway Central. The old hotel, illegally reconstructed, weakened, shaken by the regular vibrations of the BMT, settled into a pile of dust and rubble, Myrtle underneath. Myrtle had no roots, barely had a past in that it resisted her memory. Almost a perfect master, to whom the now is all, Myrtle struggled toward bedtime. Yet within the day, somehow there came to her the recognition that this moment, this urgency, was not both means and end of life, that there was not a necessity bound up in it, that things could be different. Somewhere, perhaps in the clinic where she waited to be seen and treated by the dentist, who unknown and unknowable was trusted by Myrtle with her final set of true teeth, she had found the idea of psychology. An article in a magazine that described the revolution in the life of someone who had grasped that life in its frantic whirl, slowed it, gazed upon it, understood it, took it in hand, and with gentle care set it in order. Oh, paradise unimagined, that Myrtle's life might be a life with shape and meaning unforeseen, the daily round transformed from blind obedience to the unalterable commands of rigid facts to choice, sweet choice. The cracks and gaps in the plaster above her head made images of new dwelling places, clean pictures of white comfort appearing out of the wreck of the filthy ghetto of her experience. The dirty gray creases in her rich brown knees folding and unfolding with each step that Myrtle took she walked the 14 blocks to the hospital with the psychiatric outpatient clinic to which she applied with all the hope and despair inevitable to someone faced with nothing out of which suddenly comes but only perhaps something. She filled out the application, so exhausting her energy of articulation that in the following interview even her lingo deserted her and faced with the invasive stranger who didn't even know how to pretend to say hello in any recognizable way. Myrtle could do no more than reminisce upon the fact that she had read this article and she was so tired of the things that kept happening to her that she was ready to try anything. So Rita Harner, Master of Social Work, doctoral candidate in clinical psychology at NYU, working 16 hours a week at the clinic and 16 hours a week in a madhouse in Brooklyn, knew Myrtle's need and recommended that she be accepted for treatment. Each Thursday thereafter, for the next five months, Rita and Myrtle met in a sterile room with yellow walls, white ceiling, brown desk, and two blue plastic armchairs of modern design. Four blocks from the Broadway Central, there's a bar and restaurant that caters to the NYU clientele, offering a jukebox stocked with new and old-time rock and roll, some country, and a few unclassifiable favorites, a menu with dinners from 4.50 to 8.95, plain food, well-cooked, standard desserts, not too sweet, moderately priced liquor, pretty waitresses, easy-going bartenders, soft light and patience. The color TV shows all the New York Knicks home games on the cable, and Rita was a fan. So was I a fan, and many nights after work, many nights after work, I'd walk home, wash the mild sweat of concentration off my face and the pencil grease off my hands, take a book and go to the bar for dinner, a couple of drinks and then the game. A friend of mine introduced me to Rita. I saw she was blonde and compact, tense and intelligent. I said hello, she said hello, we turned back to the game. My friend whispered in my ear, Rita's a real nice girl, she may seem a little stiff, but when she gets a couple of drinks in her, she's something else. I've often thought of having something with her, but it could never work out because we knew the wrong people in common, you know what I mean? Yeah, I said, she's very attractive, but I can never do anything that way, I'm so shy. So she, see, he said, that's a point, I said. During a commercial, I left my seat and stood behind her stool at the bar. She knew I was there because she glanced back once at me and then focused again on the game. I waited for her to finish her drink and then asked her if I could buy her another. She said, thank you. Then we got to talking. Watching the game, we grew happy because the Knicks won in an exciting finish. 
Drunk, I asked her if she'd like to come back with me to my place and smoke a little grass. Drunk, she said, okay. We put on our coats and left. We sat in my kitchen and talked. Surprise, we had old friends in common from 10 years ago in college. I had lived for three years with a woman who Rita remembered as brilliant and scandalous, whose later career she had kept in touch with through friends, through whom she had heard about me and my involvement with that woman. An old boyfriend of hers from those college days was now a friend of mine. We shared a community. She told me about her doctoral thesis, an attempt to classify the progress of schizophrenia, to say that a period like this, characterized by thoughts and feelings like this, preceded a stage like that with those thoughts and feelings, and that such a progression reflected the progression of childhood, the cumulative attempt and final failure to make sense of one's experience. I told her about my career in the university. I had studied linguistics, starting on a doctorate but quitting in the middle, having fallen for her ex-friend, with whom I came to New York in order to worship the goddess of literature. And with my knowledge of the facts of language and my, and my feeling for the inspiration of language, to resurrect from the ashes of contemporary poetry the phoenix of art, the ordered revelation of our time in my personal lens. Are we off the air? Yeah. So, there's no sense in going on. Yeah.